y'all. Welcome to episode number... 28. 28. <laughs> it's 28. 28. 28. Wow. That's a famous number for sure. You can think of something that goes 28. Davy Allison comes to mind. Why do you always do Southern stuff? He's from Alabama. How could you not love Davy Allison and the Allison game? Hmm, I was the saying, Alabama game. Let's see, Ernie Irvin. Well, he took his place. We love Ernie Irvin, but he's from California. Whatever. Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. We love him, though. Um, so we enjoyed all your comments. Appreciate y'all loving on Charlie Daniels for us. Uh, and keep listening to those other, those new songs you've never heard. They're, those are pretty cool as well. Um, tonight, we're going to uh, jump back into the Leonard Skinner genre. And tonight, we're going to talk about one of your favorite people, Joe. Al Cooper. Al Cooper, who, um, it could be said, Leonard Skinner would not have made it had it not been for that monumental meeting, <laughs> accidental monumental meeting. Um, so Al Cooper was born in, he's a New York guy, um, 1944. Uh, Happy know. birthday, Al. It's your 80th <laughs> birthday this year. That's kind of cool. Um was a music guy early on. I mean, he was in a band at the age of 14, and the band had a hit in 1958 called Short Shorts. Uh, and that became a pretty good hit. A very popular commercial during Something the Something we probably sure. all remember. Yeah, Short Shorts. Um, he went on from there to become a songwriter. Um, he went, moved to New York City to become a songwriter. Back in those days, they had songwriting houses where you'd hire people, staff come in, and they used to be writers. They'd be like, you know, sweatshops of the guys writing songs all day. And he wound up writing a couple songs, one for Gene Pitney, uh, one for Gary Lewis and the Playboys. This Diamond Ring, which is one of their big hits, was an Al Cooper song. Did you know that? I'm learning as we go. But but you you know a lot about Al Cooper. I know, I know a little bit about Al Cooper. How much, I know everything about like about Al Cooper. And he was a professional. He knew what he was doing. And, and he was just... He, listen, he has a biography called, um, boy, I can't think of the name, but anyway, an autobiography that's just fantastic. Because Al Cooper, it seemed like from the 60s and 70s, wherever something was going on in rock and roll, he was there. I mean, he was present at a lot of really cool things. And that, and he was he was a guitarist by trade, an excellent guitarist. Uh, uh, I don't know if you call him a virtuoso, but really, really good. And um, he was a songwriter in New York City, started meeting people, and eventually a uh, producer invited him to uh, a Bob Dylan recording session. Funny how Bob Dylan kind of works his way in everywhere. <laughs> I mean, we're going to talk about that in a minute, right? But, so he gets invited to Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan don't know who the hell he is. He, so he's in there like just watching, trying to be cool, and he's a guitarist, but Mike Bloomfield was there. And this is the, the meeting where uh, Al Cooper met Mike Bloomfield, and you know Mike Bloomfield, legendary guitarist, uh, unbelievable credits and stuff that he's done. And Al, you know, he kind of knew that Mike was better than him at that point, and so Mike's playing on it. But as fate would have it, on this day when they're about to record Dylan's most famous song, it is one of the most, probably the most famous song ever, I guess, a rock song. Um, the organ player doesn't show up. And Al's standing around, and somebody says, can you play organ? Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> but, you know, this guy's doing Billy Powell or nothing, but he said, yeah. So he gets in there, and they're playing like a Rolling Stone, if you can believe it. A guy who's really not a keyboard player doesn't know the song. So the famous part is during the song, He's watching the guitarist for the chords. And so the guitarist changes chords, and then Al hits that chord on the on the organ, so he's a quarter beat behind. And if you listen to that song today, like a Rolling Stone, you hear it, you go, oh my God, it's right. So they were in the listen to the song, over all the group, you know, in the you know, at the studio listening to the recording, and the producer goes, Ah, oh, Cooper, you're slow on the organ. We need to redo this. And Bob Dylan says, Hey man, I like it. A legend is born. So all of a sudden, even though he's a guitarist, Al Cooper is the man from all their kind of sessions to come in and play organ. And they'll say, I want that Bob Dylan organ thing. And Al's going, oh, okay, uh, yeah, right. 
<laughs> so he 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 kind of wrote that. He played with uh, Dylan at the Newport Folk Festival, the one where the legend is they all got booed because Dylan played that song electric. And the Folk Festival had never had electric guitars there, right? And this is 65, I think. And the legend says they were booed for playing electric. Now, Al Cooper says that's not true. They were booed because they only played three songs and left. So, makes more sense. I would boo that. I mean, I wouldn't like that a whole lot. You got Dylan, right? He's got more than three songs. <laughs> um, catalog. Yeah. So, even at that point, he had a catalog. Yeah. And But what this has done, it's opened up Al Cooper all kinds of doors. He winds up playing on Rolling Stones. I mean, just all over the place. He's playing all kinds of stuff. And he came up with this other idea about wouldn't it be cool to have a rock band that have horns, not as an you know accessory, but as a main component of the band. And he kept thinking that thing through. And eventually he came up with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And Al, the first Blood, Sweat, and Tears album to me is the very best. Um, he's a singer and yeah, he might not be, you know, Paul Rogers or whatever, but he's a pretty good vocalist and it's a great record, but it didn't make money. And the band had this opportunity to bring in, you know, the other, the future vocalist and Al was out of his own band pretty much. Is that what it read? He didn't, he wouldn't have a chance to stick around for their success that was to be. Yeah, they were, they're fixing to make some money, right? But it wasn't with Al. And, but Al didn't let that stop him. He kept moving, right? Um, he was playing on other people's sessions and doing stuff. He toured a little bit with Dylan. But then a guy calls him from Atlanta and says, Hey, man, we got a great studio down here. You need to come down and check this studio out. And so Al was about to record another band. He said, Okay, we'll bring the band down there and we'll rent a house for a month and we'll record. So, do you know the story? No, man. I'm learning as you go. Well, I is read the studio, book. Is this studio one? Yeah. I read the book. I, I'm, 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 I'm with you. It's something like backstage it. passes and backstabbing and backstabbers. backstabbers. Yeah, I think it's something like that. That's his autobiography. Anyway, so he goes down to Atlanta to check out the studio, and it's a great studio. It's got a great sound, a great vibe, and he's all about it. And then, you know, a club owner asks him, says, hey, come down to our club and hang out, I'll give you the VIP treatment, right? So Al and the band, all these people go down there and they have a suite up in the thing. And um, would that be? <laughs> it just happens to be the start of a six night stint for a band he'd never heard of called Leonard Skinner. And the first night he's going, wow, they're playing all original stuff. I, I like it. The second night, I like it more. And they're tight. He, he notices how tight that band really is. He does. Note for note, they're tight. Third night, loves it. Fourth night, he asked Ronnie Kenny to go on stage with him and play. Well, Ronnie's pretty cool about picking up on people who just want to be on stage. <laughs> and so Ronnie kind of thought, well, this guy probably ain't got no talent. So... Let's uh, let's throw him a curveball. So it was something I don't remember the exact thing. The song was like a, was a a blues song, and uh, he said, "Yeah, let's play it in uh, C sharp." Knowing that only a real guitarist could pick that up, and Al smiled to himself and thought, "Yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> yeah, I like this guy a lot." And um, it wasn't long after that that um, he went out to MCA and convinced them to have his own label. And Sounds of the South Records was born. Was that power? Do you have that power to go to MCA, to the, the top the top brass? If you read his book, Al Cooper knew everybody, and everybody knew him. He was a name, and when Al Cooper says, I can find some talent, I've been there, I've seen some stuff, so he saw into another band first, Mose Jones or somebody, I don't know who it was, and they didn't, they didn't do so well. And then um, he signed Leonard Skinner. It took a while. In fact, he went, he went and met at a bar with, I guess it was Alan and Gary. And Alan and Gary said, hey man, we're available. 
but you got to please the man, right? You got to make the steel of Roddy Van Zandt. That's the brass we're talking about. And if you look at interviews with Al or read what he said, this man has the ultimate respect for Ronnie Van Zandt. Yeah, he's a tough son of a bitch. But as a band leader, he used the term, he whipped them into shape. He knew that band was tight. And there's a reason you have a, a band like that that tight. It was because of the leader of the band. Yeah, and he he was he was a taskmaster. You know, Ronnie was he wanted it a certain way and he wanted it perfect and wanted it that way every time. You know. Um so they got signed and Al goes in to record with them. And basically, even though Al's producer, Ronnie is the producer. Ronnie's making all the decisions and Al's trying to make suggestions as they go. And every time he makes a suggestion, it's, no, nope, we're doing it this way. That's what Ronnie would tell him. Then, like the 20th suggestion Al made, Alan goes, hey, man, just quit making suggestions because we're going to do it our way. And Ronnie, of all people, comes to Al's aid and says, hey, it's cool. Keep making suggestions. And if we only take one out of 20, it's good for us. And to, to Al, that kind of cemented their bond. You know, that Ronnie, yeah, you're professional. I want to hear your opinion. We might not want to do it, but we might. You know? Um, Respect. You know, there was a famous story about Simple Man. Where they said, get out of here. We're going to record this song however we want to. You come back tomorrow. Yeah, Al Cooper said this is not good enough for the record. He, he didn't like it. He didn't. It didn't. It didn't fit for Al Cooper's thoughts. Yeah, and so they told him to leave. And when Ronnie Van Zandt tells you to leave, it's probably what you do, right? And of course, he came back, and when he heard it, he got it. You know, Al understood. Yeah, this is a great song, right? Um, so the song, the album is in the can and he goes out to Los Angeles to the MCA offices to kind of brag about it a little bit, talk about, you know, this record is coming out and he runs into none other than Pete Townsend in the hall. The who was on MCA records at that time. And Pete, and he says, Pete, what are y'all fixing to do? He goes, well, we're fixing to release this Quadrophini album. Then we're going to have a worldwide tour. And he goes, Oh, that's great, man. That's really great. I'm proud of you. And Pete goes, by the way, you don't happen to know anybody who might be fit into our opening slot, do you? Maybe I do. Fate <laughs> comes to play I mean, once again. Music is fate, and, and it being in the right place at the right time, coincidences right happen. Right time. Uh, once again, just like when Al Cooper goes to Atlanta and happens to go down to, was it Pinocchio or something like that? Pinocchio's was the bar. Yeah, and during the six-day run that Skinner was there. Um, unbelievable. And so Al says, you know, Pete, I think I know somebody that would do it. And Pete said, really? He said, take this record. It was just a test pressing of pronounced. <laughs> Pete called him the next day and said, yeah, that's a great record. We'd be proud to have those guys open for us. So there you go. People were digging on Leonard Skinner before the record was even released, right? Do we love Pete Townsend? We'll always have a spot for Pete Townsend. Well, he's pretty great. He's pretty great. Um, but the record is about to be released. It's in the can, and Al gets a call from Ronnie. Hey, I got this song. And if we don't record it now, we're going to keep changing it and screw it up. It's perfect right now. Al goes, well, you know, we, we the record's already, so I don't care. we got to record this song right now. Okay. If Ronnie says it, Al, listen. I think there was a mutual respect going on between Clearly. the two. Clearly. Al understood Ronnie knew what the hell he was doing. And Ronnie had, had a plan. I mean, R Ronnie wasn't an MIT scholar or anything, but that dude was smart. Yeah. He was smart. So they meet one evening and they kind of mess around with it al thought oh my yeah let's meet the studio tomorrow so the next day they re recorded 
I think it's Studio One, Sweet Home Alabama. Now, that song sat on the shelf for a year before Second Helping was actually released. And, but as we know, Skinner started playing it live. I heard it live, right? No, October 30th, 1973. But it was such an explosive song, and Al knew it. He knew it. And by the way, a little trivia there. In this song, Al sings. Oh, he does. Yes, he does. When they go, closely. heard Miss Young sing about her. And if you listen to one, one earphone, you can hear Al's falsetto going, Southern man. <laughs> That's Gooch. Al Cooper, man. Al Cooper. Yeah. Um, What's his name? Roosevelt. Roosevelt Gooch. <laughs> um, <laughs> we read all the album credits on this stuff. <laughs> well, that was a big thing for him, I think. But... Um, the song stays in the can, and Second Helping is released. Now, y'all probably don't realize this, but Pronounce wasn't a huge hit. It, it was not a huge hit, even though Free Bird was an anthem. And the first time that Al heard it, he knew it was going to be an anthem. He just, he knew. Any kid, any 15-year-old kid hears this song, they're going to go crazy. And we all did. But that didn't fit on the radio. You know, in those you, days, the DJ had to hear that too. Well, the DJ, you had to almost convince the DJ to play your song. But songs were all three minutes. I know, three minutes. And so to what's, this coincided about the time the album-oriented rock, FM, as Steely Dan would call it, got started. And so when FM came in, suddenly you could play a 10-minute song. Suddenly you could play Stairway to Heaven. You know, all these things that happened. And it got on radio all the time. Second album is released, and Al's thinking, man, I can't release Sweet Home Alabama first because I got nothing to follow it with. Skinner was not a band full of singles, you know? So he released Don't Ask Me No Questions. It flopped. It but flopped. still, still, it turns it to be one of Skinner's anthems, I think. Don't Ask Me No Questions. I think. I think they're all anthems. Oh, they all classics. are, but no, man, they're classics. It's classic. We were talking about radio, and that kind of, everything didn't fly on but radio. It flopped, that's right. And then he knew. He released Sweet Home Alabama, and it just went berserk. As we know, that is when suddenly Freebirds on the radio, Sweet Home Alabama's on AM radio, it's everywhere. You know, it was like caught up in you. It was on every channel. And they just... It, that's really what kicked it off. Now, Al then produced the third record. Uh, had th Saturday Night Special on it. But, you know, while that was a great song, it was not a big commercial success, right? And that was kind of his time with Skinner. Uh, now, interestingly enough, he went on to produce the first two records for the Johnny Van Zandt Band, right? I mean, which I think the first record in particular is great. Incredible. Just, just incredible. Um... Al continued to write, can, continued to be in, an influencer in, in music, was um, inducted in all kinds of different Hall of Fames and stuff. I think the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year, right? He's in there. Yeah. Um, Not that it means anything. <laughs> yeah, we're not. <laughs> but his greatness is there. Yeah. His list of credits are there. He actually belongs there. <laughs> He's definitely earned his just <laughs> Just like Warren Zevon belongs yes. there. And what tells wrong them people? And we're very lucky to have someone in there who does belong yeah. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, and that's Al Cooper. Um, I'll tell you a personal story. You know, I had this original sweatshirt, right? S original Sounds of the South sweatshirt. Never been touched that Ronnie gave me, but I just wanted to try to authenticate it. Well, first of all, my daughter had a record and I wanted a great producer. So I actually got in touch with Al Cooper. This is 2009 or 10 and said, Hey, I explained to him, I sent him some of the, some of the songs some the demos and everything. And uh, we corresponded back and forth email, but he basically said, listen, I just really ain't got time to do anything. I'm work all the time. I'm working on a super group, which was one of his own little projects that he had over the years. I think Mike Bloomfield was involved in a bunch of people. But anyway, he was very nice, very curious. Did mention that he's seen the shirt and he knew it. Um, very genuine guy, I thought. Now I'm communicating with him through email, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, basically, 
we have skimmed the surface now, Cooper. Lightly, to yeah. say the least. Yeah, I mean, we try to do this all in 10 minutes. It's hard to talk about a legend like that. And I think the connection with us is that, as fate would have it, he discovered Leonard Skinner. He put him on Sounds of South Records. He got him on the Who Tour. Um, and really, those things, he gained Ronnie's confidence. You know, he, he was a great producer, probably because he just listened to Ronnie. You know, and, and Alan and Gary. and You know. And I think, like you said, when they came into the studio, they were ready to go. There wasn't a whole lot of changes to be made. They were ready. Ronnie had them ready. They were doing the same thing all the time. And they knew that they knew what they were doing. Yeah, and I don't. I mean, I'm giving Ronnie all the credit. I probably shouldn't because the the guys in the band, you know, if you look at all of them, I'm sure they all had influence into it, particularly Alan and Gary, and and because they used their own artistic talents to create these things, right? And they were the music writers of all these songs. Um, I don't know. Al Cooper was vital. Uh, his autobiography is unbelievable. It's one of the best ones. Uh, Keith Richards was really good, but Al Cooper is right up there, man. Uh, so I advise you to read the, the Al Cooper book. It's great. Um, we love Al Cooper. Happy birthday. Happy 80th birthday. You, you're on episode 28, so that's cool. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about? I just, I just love to think about it. It just thrills me. All these musical, all these bands, all these producers, there's so much circumstance and coincidence that everything just falls into place with music. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It just does. Yeah. I mean, there is a music god out there, you know, saint music or whatever. And these <laughs> things just happen. And we are so lucky. He's lucky enough. He's in Atlanta at a certain time, you know, that Skinner's in Atlanta. And, <sighs> you know, he's always recruiting talent. He's always out, you know, scoping talent. And, you know... Like I say, the lords, the gods, have just blessed us. Yeah, and, and so thank you, Al Cooper, for helping us to discover Leonard Skinner. Because who knows what would have happened if he hadn't? They might still be playing six night gigs at Pinocchio's. Um, anyway, anything else? I think that's all good. Hey, we really enjoy the comments. Please share these videos. Get other people to subscribe. Uh, once we reach a thousand subscribers, we're going to do something really special. <laughs> I can't even tell you how special it's going to be. It's unbelievable. Um, until next time, Joe. Thank y'all so much for your support and comments. And we love every one of you. And we'll see you next time on Skinner Shorts. <laughs>